like to start by um, saying thank you to Danielle and Laura and everyone else for inviting me and um, organizing everything around this conference. I was here on Tuesday to check if some of the technology related to my talk worked okay. And one of the things that I learned was that um, the main lights in this building, after they're switched off, take about one hour to uh, go on again. And when I reflected on that, I thought that was actually symbolic of something quite beautiful and important. Namely, um, that we're all coming here together, 20,000 people, sharing this excitement about the prospects of modern technology. But within this historical building from the 50s. And in doing that, we really pay honor to all of those communities of people and their innovations from the past that preceded the innovations of the present and the future. Now, with, with that reflection in our minds, I, I really like to invite you to go even a little bit further than that and remember where we came from. Literally billions of years of evolution, 200,000, 300,000 years that followed um, since Homo sapiens, since human beings arrived on that scene. And, and in that period, we, we, we mastered fire, we invented wheels, we invented musical instruments, medicines, machines, internet, so forth and so on. We have proven to be very skilled in, in problem solving. Um, and one of the main reasons why um, for this is because of our remarkably complex human brain, which can facilitate a remarkably um, diverse amount of different states of consciousness, different qualities in which we perceive ourselves and the world around us. And um, one of the reasons for this is, um, one of the consequences of that is, is that from day to day, and also from, and through our whole lives, from birth till death, we experience all these different degrees of wakefulness, different degrees of excitement, different degrees of happiness, um, our sense of fulfillment, our sense of belonging, our sense of self-worth, and so forth and so on. Um, all of this is in constant change. The way we perceive ourselves, our states of mind, are in constant, constant flux. And some of these ways serve us really well. Some others, not so much. And um, when we found ourselves in that latter situation, when when life is challenging, when we suffer, and we naturally seek support, and we naturally seek care. Um, unfortunately, that situation for way too many people right now is not a very nice situation to be in. I just share some statistics with you. Just for depression alone, two-thirds of all care seekers seeking, seeking help remain suffering from symptoms after they receive treatment. And for a striking one-third of all care seekers, not a single treatment they try out works for them. Now, what I personally find most striking is that when you look at treatment efficacy, to simply the efficacy of the treatment itself, this has not improved for the last 70 years. I'll just repeat that, just to let that instill in you. Treatment efficacy has not improved for seven decades. And 39% just in Europe alone suffers, somebody in Europe suffers some form of mental health problem each year. And globally, this leads to an incredible economic burden and an incredible amount of unresolved human suffering. Now, this, this question here, this split here, it's very clear that that is not a question anymore. There are fundamental flaws in the way we currently understand. There's something really wrong, something fundamentally flawed in the ways we currently understand and, and view um, mental health and mental health problems. Now, for the last seven, seven years, I, I worked as a neuroscientist at Imperial College London, studying an emerging therapeutic modality called psychedelic therapy. And there's more and more evidence that um, in clinical trials, these compounds can be safe and effective to treat some very 
severe conditions, including depression, addiction, trauma, end-of-life anxiety. Now, within this model, care seekers receive the drug within a specially designed environment. And they are supported by psychotherapists, um, and, and then they experience a profound altered state of consciousness. They wear blindfolds, so they, they're aided to really focus all of their attention inwards. And then for the four to eight hours that follow, they listen to music. Now, in my own, in my own work, I primarily focused on studying and understanding the therapeutic mechanisms that are, that are at play here, both from a neuroscience perspective and a psychological perspective. And, um, and one of the, one of the, way, one of the main, main ways we are currently understanding what is going on in this form of therapy is that what these compounds are doing is they're temporarily enhance um, mental flexibility. They enhance the capacity to feel, think, and perceive the world around us and ourselves very differently. And within that state, um, the individual has an incredible, strongly enhanced response to music. Music-evoked emotions are, are intensified. Um, memories and, and mental imagery become incredibly vivid. And what we found, and this is really a growing consensus in this, in this scientific movement, is that it's not the drug that is therapeutic. It's the experience that people have, and in particular, the experience of the music that people have that predicts the therapeutic improvement. And often, very often, care seekers describe these experiences to be one of the most meaningful experiences they had in their lives. In some studies, 80%, 80% described that this was amongst the most personally and spiritually meaningful experience of their entire lives. Now, I believe that there are some really important insights that we can draw from this field that are very, very strongly aligned with our current understanding of human development. And importantly, do not constrain themselves to the field of psychedelic drug research only, but may in fact be foundational to the, to the innovation that mental health care is so urgently needing right now. I will guide you through these insights. And the first insight is really based on a very very fundamental principle in the neuroscience of learning and development. And that is that our identities are shaped by the experiences we undergo in our lives. And in particularly by experiences that are personally meaningful to us. And therefore the only way to really facilitate a sustained improvement in somebody's mental health is by providing new experiences to people. In the same way as you can only learn to ride a bicycle by riding a bicycle. So can you only learn to feel self-confidence, self-worthy, meaning in life, and so forth and so on, by experiencing it. And this brings me to the, to the next point. If experience is the foundation for personal transformation, we need to look at and work with those whose very expertise it is to provide experiences to people. Art has come to play many different functions in our lives, but we should never forget that art has the capacity to facilitate truly, profoundly meaningful experiences to us. There's a very good reason that archaeologists, amongst um, some of the most ancient tools that archaeologists uncovered, are musical instruments, estimated to be around 30,000 years old. The next insight is that any form, of, any form of care, any form of mental health care, must be human-centered. Every person has a personal story that carries a unique set of fundamental human needs. Human needs for belonging, human needs for love, human needs for meaningful work. And whenever we face, whenever individuals face difficult emotions, they should not be seen or treated as problems that need to be suppressed. But, but as messages, and when we listen to them, these messages can give us insight what human needs are unmet for us. And then 
challenges and challenging emotions can become opportunities for personal growth. The next point I really like to stress is that learning is essentially rewarding. Learning is fun. And therefore, any care model that is essentially concerned with learning new things about oneself, personal growth, learning new things about oneself and the world around you, should be and can be deeply engaging and deeply rewarding. And because this need for care, because the need for support in our personal growth is universal, it's something that everyone here shares, it's also, effective care should also be easy to access and easy to use. And this really brings me to the final point that I'm sharing, and that is that really the latest breakthroughs in technology and machine learning, biometrics, together with all the advancements in, in contemporary art and psychotherapy and spiritual practices, they can be unified in a single model that can facilitate experiences to people that are so deeply personally meaningful that they become what I call transformative experiences. Experiences that, that lead to a sustained improvement in somebody's mental health and well-being beyond that single experience. And if technology is successful in doing that, um, then we can define that technology as being a psychedelic technology. I'm quite sure that many of you have many different associations with the word psychedelic, and some of them may be quite wild. Um, but it's derived from combining two Greek words, and it has a beautiful, and I've found, found quite, quite precise meaning, ne namely the word psyche, which stands for soul or mind, and the word delaun, meaning to make visible or to make reveal. So a psychedelic is a technology or a compound that reveals or manifests the soul or the mind. And I believe that in the same way that medical doctors use medical technologies to access and heal the body, in that same way, um, the future of mental health care will be characterized by psychedelic technologies to access and heal the soul. And this, these insights, these points that I'm sharing with you are really the foundations for finding wave paths, um, which I work for full time, full time right now since the beginning of this year in January. And um, we are really a growing multidisciplinary team of artists, scientists, therapists, technologists, and we are engaging in three primary activities. We study transformative experiences, and then we, we bring these experiences to people by developing a new category of therapeutic tools and therapeutic urban environments. And like I said, we focus specifically on transformative experiences, which I will define just one more time. These are experiences that bring about a sustained positive change in somebody's mental health and well-being. And in, in doing this, we are particularly interested in studying and working with the use of generative art. Now, generative art stands for um, a set of computational rules that through an interaction um, between creative and AI and an artist create artistic content. And what you see here is an example of generative light art made by Brian Eno, one of our WavePads collaborators. And what you are hearing is an example of generative music made by another WavePads collaborator, namely the musician John Hopkins. Now, by bringing together this multidisciplinary expertise, we develop what we call adaptive generative media, meaning generative art that adapts itself, that is tailored to the individuals changing emotional needs and changing therapeutic needs in order that the experience becomes so immersive and so deeply personally meaningful that it indeed may be a transformative experience for that individual. And we, we aim to um, make these experiences really globally accessible through the development of digital tools and urban spaces with both public versions for care seekers and um, customized versions for care providers. And with these activities, our mission is really to, to contribute to this much needed 
paradigm shift in mental health care that I mentioned earlier. We, we develop a new model of care. And we believe that the way we care for ourselves and the way we can care for others, it can be and must be as inspiring as a retreat in nature, as rewarding as that feeling you have after a great exercise, and as easy to access as routine as a daily shower. I really like to thank you for your attention, and I want to end with um, two invitations. One is we are soon closing our first investment round and are expanding our team at the moment and are particularly interested in hiring software engineers. And the second point is um, for those in the audience with a, with a strong interest in the science underlying all, everything I just shared, um, I have a PDF with a list of references that I can also share with you. So if anything of this um, is of interest to you, um, please be in touch either through email or my website or just after, after this talk. Thank you very much. We did quite, quite a few questions, but since we're going to have to go into our next talk, I'll just do one, basically, that came up. Is for those wanting to try out these treatments now, how do you find practitioners or people who are responsible and prof professional, despite the legality. <laughs> How do you find people that actually will do this and actually go through those studies? Right. Um, well, finding participants is really not a problem at all. We get a <laughs> huge amount of emails. Um, um, but yeah, finding the right individuals, that's, mm -hmm. that's the, the key challenge. So right now, this, so th this question is specifically about psychedelic therapy, so treatment with psychedelic drugs. Um, we do legal research at Imperial. Mm -hmm. um, and we have really strict inclusion criteria for that. Mm -hmm. um, one of them being no background, uh, having no family history in schizophrenia. Um, mm -hmm. And that people basically go through a whole list of um, terrible questionnaires and screening procedures to participate in these okay. studies. Yeah. Very nice, thank you. I, like I said, we are, have run out of time. He is going to be doing an AMA at 4.30 and ask me anything at a session in the Stuba. So for whatever questions that you have, you're more likely to go there and also ask him. Thank you very much. Everyone give a warm hand clap. Thank you.